everyone for joining us. Uh, this is an, uh, an exciting session. Um, and I think although, even though we're in just the first day of SciCon, it wouldn't be premature for us to congratulate CCD, COE on, on yet another superb event. Uh, if like me, you're a, a follower of their event and, the, and their work, <clears throat> you'll know that the subject of this panel uh, has been one of a consistent strain <clears throat> throughout their events, uh, the problem of attribution. Uh, if you look at the early versions of the event, I, I think what you see are relatively siloed or stovepiped approaches to attribution. Early on, I, I think the various communities involved in cybersecurity each realized they had uh, perhaps a peculiar or particular perspective. That is, from the technicians, uh, there was, I, I think, a logical focus on the digital forensics that are involved in a cyber attribution effort. Uh, from, the, from the political track, of course, uh, there was interest in the political will or the diplomatic climate that surrounds a, an effort to do a cyber attribution. And then finally, the community that I come from that I'm most familiar with, uh, we international lawyers explored what attribution meant to us. And of course, I, I think cyberspace and, and the, the conversations we've seen at SciCons uh, have to some extent resurrected uh, our interest in the Articles of State Responsibility, how international law and how states have agreed to assign responsibility for internationally wrongful acts. This has led us, I think, to helpful uh, discussions and elaborations on notions like control. What does wielding effective control over a non-state actor mean? Uh, how can states assign responsibility among organizations in a way that holds them responsible uh, under applicable international law. But there's a flaw, of course, to these stovepipe efforts or these siloed efforts. It, it seems to do the, that to do the real work of attribution uh, requires an intersectional effort, that these are cross-disciplinary uh, efforts. And uh, so in that vein, we have presentations from three panelists that I think will emphasize that. The theme you will find in each is an effort on the part of an international lawyer in each case uh, or a policymaker to weave together the technical, uh, the political, and the legal elements of attribution. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to their presentations. Uh, we'll begin with Ms. Lise Vihul. Uh, Lise is the Chief Executive Officer at Cyberlaw International. Uh, she's also a member of the Estonian delegation to the United Nations Group of Government Experts. Um, and finally, she is an ambassador uh, and an alumna of the CCD COE itself. Uh, and Lise, of course, was managing editor of the Tallinn Manual 2.0 on international law applicable to cyber operations. Lise, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Sean. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this session on attribution. Indeed, as uh, someone who spent uh, several years working at the CCD COE, it's uh, always a distinct pleasure to come back to SciCon, uh, to uh, come back to an event that really feels like home. Uh, today, what I'm going to talk about is how international law standards governing the issue of attribution uh, uh, how they apply in the cyber context, and then secondly, if and to what extent the international law standards affect the policy attribution of malicious cyber activity. So without further ado, I'll just uh, get straight to uh, the topic. Now, first of all, to understand how law affects policy, um, I should uh, briefly tell you about how international law regulates the issue of attribution. And in law, attribution is actually a two-step process. Okay. The first step involves identifying what the legal standards for attribution are, and there are several in international law. I'll briefly go over those. And then the second step in the international law of attribution is to apply the law to the facts. In other words, it's the evidentiary question. With regard to the first step, like I mentioned, there are several bases for regarding acts of certain entities as those of states under international law. The ground rule, the most common, the most uncontroversial rule is that when we have what are called organs of states acting, then their actions, their cyber activities are attributable to a state. Uh, what are organs? 
Organs are entities that make up the governmental structure of a state. So if you wear a uniform, you're an organ of a state. When you engage in malicious cyber activity that violates international law, your state has violated international law. If you work for the Ministry of Defense, uh, if you work for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, if you work for a cyber center of excellence or a national cert, then your actions qualify as actions of an organ of a state, therefore they're attributable. And if you, through your actions, engage in uh, some sort of conduct that is in breach of international legal obligations, then your country has violated international law. The other test has got somewhat of a clumsy articulation. It has to do with entities that are empowered by law to exercise elements of governmental authority. The first two tests are based on an institutional link. And the second one, the entities empowered by law, these have to do with certain parastatal entities that engage in governmental functions. In the non-cyber context, we would talk about private military companies. In the cyber context, for example, a cybersecurity firm uh, that does intelligence for a state. And as you know, some cybersecurity companies have a very close relationship with a particular government. They do intelligence for the state. The employees hold um, high-level security clearances. So in such a situation, we might have an entity that is empowered by law, even though as factually it's a private company, to carry out governmental uh, uh, governmental functions and therefore that entity's actions are attributable. If the entity, the cybersecurity firm, engages in intelligence collection and excessively infringes upon the privacy of individuals, it is actually the state that has violated international law. And then finally, the third a third common basis for attribution has to do with a factual link between a state and a non-state actor. And the rule goes as follows. If you're a state and you're instructing, directing, or controlling a non-state actor to engage in malicious cyber activity, then that actor's activities are attributable to you. So that's the law in a nutshell, very simplified, but these are the key legal basis for attribution in international law. Now the second question really has to do with applying the law to the facts, like I mentioned. And this is especially relevant in the cyber context because uh, as you will know, states very rarely will have absolute certainty that indeed an organ of a state was behind a malicious cyber activity or that a state indeed was instructing a private company to engage in malicious cyber activity. So the legal question for us is, how much evidence is enough evidence? Uh, what does the law say about that? How well do the facts need to be established? And here it is important to distinguish between different purposes of attribution because the rules are somewhat different. One purpose of attribution, uh, arguably an emerging practice of attribution, is to name and shame other states for having engaged in cyber operations that violate international law. To my knowledge, only one state has done so. It was the United Kingdom in uh, October last year when they attributed several cyber operations to the Russian GRU. And there, the UK National Cybersecurity Center said that those operations, without specifying which ones, constituted flagrant violation of international law. Okay. To my knowledge, this is the only example of a state naming and shaming another country for having violated international law. How much proof does the country accusing the other state of having violated international law need to have? Well, the answer is, the state, as a strict matter of law, doesn't need to have any proof. Okay. International law doesn't prohibit lying, so the state may even be making up this claim without it being a violation of international law. For rule of law countries, of course, uh, this is something that I personally would not anticipate. I would not anticipate them going out with those fake statements. And this was also confirmed uh, last April by the Ambassador for Cyber Affairs of Australia. Uh, he said that we wouldn't be saying these things in the international environment just for the fun of it. It's the fact that we have evidence to prove that this activity is attributed to, to you. So this is the practice of states, but international law doesn't require states to have any level of, uh, of confidence in the facts for the, for the simple purpose of naming and shaming. 
The situation is somewhat different when it comes to what are known as measures of unilateral self-help. And those of you who were in the deterrence panel, you heard some of them being mentioned. For example, the inherent right of states to engage in self-defense is a measure of self-help. The right to engage in countermeasures or the right to respond to cyber operations based upon the plea of necessity. These are measures of self-help. And with regard to uh, the exercise of self-help, uh, international law is perhaps even uh, surprisingly accommodating of the concern that states will not have 100% certainty when it comes to the attribution issue. For the right of self-defense, for example, most international law scholars would say, well, the standard is we ask what would a reasonable state in the same or similar circumstances conclude about the author of the operation? What would a reasonable state conclude about attribution? And if it is reasonable for a state that is suffering from a cyber armed attack, and you should know that this is a very high threshold, if the state is faced with such a national security threat, does the state need to have absolute certainty with regard to the attribution issue? Answer is no. We ask what is it reasonable for the state to conclude as to the author of the operation? The rules are uh, yet different for uh, judicial proceedings. We haven't seen it yet, but I'm certain somewhere down the road this is going to happen where a cyber dispute will appear before an international court or tribunal. Uh, the International Court of Justice, for example, if the ICJ were to uh, hear a cyber dispute, the court would apply its own standard of proof. For the ICJ, it's going to be somewhere between beyond a reasonable doubt and clear and convincing evidence, somewhere along this spectrum. For an international criminal court, okay, international criminal tribunal, the standard will be beyond a reasonable doubt. So the standards will vary depending on the court or tribunal that uh, we're talking about. And then finally, uh, since most disputes between states are settled outside of courts, they're settled in negotiations, then if states were to sit down at a table and negotiate uh, a cyber dispute, Okay, the standard of proof that will apply will be whatever the, the parties to the dispute to decide. Okay, it may be the preponderance of evidence. Facts are more likely uh, this than not. So really the standard of evidence in international law will depend on what kind of attribution are we talking about? What is the purpose of the attribution? So this is international law. What does policy say? What are we seeing states do? With regard to policy attribution, I've uh, arbitrarily picked three statements where states have accused other states of having engaged in malicious cyber activity and statements that also articulate the level of confidence of the accusing state. And you'll see that in uh, 2016, the US government, for example, said, the intelligence community said that they were confident that it was Russia who interfered in the Democratic National Committee's uh, communications and released them. The UK's uh, National Cybersecurity Center, uh, two years ago in uh, December 2017, said it was highly likely that WannaCry was attributable to North Korea. And the same center in the UK said that uh, the GRU was almost certainly responsible for the various cyber operations that were attributed to the GRU. And the National Cybersecurity Center made that assessment with high confidence. Finally, you'll see that uh, in the US, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence has put out guidance on uh, what certain uh, confidence levels mean, and you'll see that high confidence really is a very high confidence level indeed. High confidence for the ODNI is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Without a reasonable alternative, that's a very high standard. And moderate confidence is also, to my eyes, a very high standard, clear and convincing, with no circumstantial cases for alternatives. So these are very, very high standards. The point that I'm trying to get to is that policy uh, experts are often very careful to emphasize that political attribution, statements like these, are solely political determinations and law doesn't play much of a role in those determinations. 
It is true, unless we're talking about a state accusing another state of having violated international law, but as, you'll see, as you've just seen, states, even for political attribution, require a very high level of confidence in the facts. They, as a matter of political practice, employ a very high standard of proof before they go out and accuse another state of having engaged in malicious cyber activity. So perhaps the concern about mixing law and policy, at least when it comes to public attributions, is a bit overstated. Okay. Now, when states attribute cyber activities uh, in the policy sense, they don't just say a state did it, but they also make sure to condemn the cyber activity. Here again, I have three arbitrary examples from last year, okay, three different countries accusing other states of having engaged in bad behavior in cyberspace. And what is interesting here is the language that they employ. When you take a careful look at those statements, can you see that the wording is very, very careful. It's very laid back. It's not categorical. Estonia is saying that Russia is called on to act responsibly and in accordance with international law. Okay. Australia says that Russia is acting contrary to the consensus of international law and norms. The Netherlands, the GRU, was undermining international law. So these are very uh, opaque, very vague statements. They're not horribly specific. So the question that I ask is, why are we not seeing states come out with more concrete accusations? Why are they not saying that country X violated international law, in particular rule X, as well as three rules on this responsible state behavior, which are the following? So why are we not seeing states do that? Probably one of the reasons is that as states apply international law and norms of responsible state behavior in this domain, they are acutely aware of the fact that they are engaged in a balancing act. And this means that as rule of law countries are investing heavily into cyber capability development, they are cognizant that once they start drawing the lines in the sand, they are not only creating rules for other countries, but they're also creating rules for themselves, and uh, they're careful not to prematurely tie their own hands. Uh, also, rule of law countries, I suspect, are, uh, take, account, take into account the fact that when they draw those clearer lines, then uh, their adversaries are not necessarily rule of law countries. So in effect, countries are creating rules for themselves that their adversaries are unlikely to follow. I personally find this uh, a troubling consideration. Why? especially in today's international security environment, which is, uh, which is very flammable, uh, which is very worrisome, I think states should not walk back on the norms, uh, normative order, but rather enforce the normative order, insist on a rules-based uh, cyberspace, rather than leave it as vague, as gray, as open to action as possible. And, uh, and this inevitably raises the question, well, okay, we may have rules, but how do you ensure compliance with those rules? How do you ensure that both rules of responsible state behavior as well as international law really make a difference, that it's not just that good countries, if you will, that abide by the rules, but that all actors who are active in this domain abide by those rules? Now, the first comment that I would make here is that rules, as a general matter, they're meant to uh, provide guidance for states ex ante. Uh, if you again were in the deterrence panel, you heard Jay Healy say that uh, the way rules are being worked out at the moment is on the go, on the battlefield, in action, states poking elbows at each other, rather than ex ante determining what is acceptable behavior and what is unacceptable. Uh, this goes against uh, the logic of norms, of having norms, of having laws, which prescribe in advance which uh, behavior is acceptable, tolerated, and which is prohibited, thereby putting uh, actors on notice what kind of behavior is expected of them. The related issue, of course, is that of enforcement, which is a whole can of worms in and of itself, but we probably cannot talk about enforcement unless we have articulated at least some rules, because how do we enforce rules if we don't know what the rules are? Um, 
Enforcement, again, there are several, several ways of enforcing rules. Some of them come from international law itself. Self-help measures are a tool for enforcing international law. Judicial process is a form of enforcing international law. But other extrajudicial, extra-legal measures, of course, are available to enforce international law as well, be they economic, diplomatic, military, you name it. And then final point, uh, because this is a panel on attribution, what about all those states that do not have the capacity to attribute, that do not have powerful allies uh, with whom to do joint attribution? What are they left with? And the answer, at least in part, lies in a notion that is known uh, commonly as due diligence. And uh, the due diligence notion says that states must or should take reasonably feasible action to ensure that their state is not used by, by third parties to the detriment of other states. Now, due diligence, unfortunately, has proven to be a uh, controversial issue in international relations. If you ask almost any international lawyer, they will say that due diligence is a rule of international law. In other words, states not only should do so, but states must ensure that their territory is not used in such a way. And there are several countries that say, yes, this is international law, including Estonia in uh, this morning's speech. However, it's, it's mostly bigger, more powerful countries that reject due diligence as uh, binding international law. I mean, we can speculate why different countries uh, reject this, and to an extent, they probably have uh, different uh, rationales. But as a generalization, I feel that bigger countries are much more willing to, um, to ascertain rights under international law rather than, than they are willing to self-impose international legal obligations on them. But if due diligence uh, was treated as law, it, it would mean for those countries that do not have the capacity to attribute that what they need to do is to find, uh, is to only trace back the cyber operation to the territorial state where it is coming from. It doesn't need to prove a nexus between the territory and that uh, territorial government or a third government. All that the state needs to do is say, it comes from your territory, it's causing serious harm to me, and you have a legal obligation to do everything that you reasonably can to put an end to it. So with that, I will finish for now. Thank you, Louise. So as a matter of how we'll proceed, let's hold the questions till the end. Uh, but as the moderator, I reserve the prerogative to ask questions now. Uh, Lees, while the others are presenting, I, I wonder if you could consider this. Attribution, or the attribution game, no longer seems to be the exclusive prerogative of states. We have highly capable and well-resourced actors, I'm thinking of CrowdStrike and Mandiant, uh, making very public attributions, at least in a technical sense. Do these frustrate the delicate balance you referred to that states are engaged in their, in their own attribution efforts? Are they forcing states' hands? Are they doing attribution uh, differently than states are uh, in a way that frustrates uh, their efforts? Perhaps you'd be willing to think on that and we'll come back to you uh, after the other presenters. Okay, our final presenter then is uh, Professor Rob Barnsby. Rob is a retired United States Army officer with experience in military intelligence uh, and in the Judge Advocate General's Corps. Uh, he's currently an assistant professor at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Can I get a beat, Navy? There we go. <laughs> He is also a cyber fellow at the Army Cyber Institute, and he's learned most recently that this fall he'll join the faculty of University of California Berkeley Law School as a visiting professor. Rob, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Sean, for that uh, very kind introduction. I'd like to also thank the organizers for Another great event. I remember last year, around the time of SciCon, there was an Iron Maiden concert here. Pretty cool. This year, I get <laughs> off the plane, and the taxi driver says Metallica is coming in the next week or two. And I just thought, well, even the concerts are getting better and better here. Now, the cadets for Wiz said, sir, what is a Metallica? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, only the best band ever. 
But um, I do want to welcome our cadets and midshipmen, too. Uh, we actually have a second lieutenant here who just graduated on Saturday. She actually gave up her leave. Jenny, congratulations on that, uh, graduating West Point. Gave up her leave and vacation to come here the next day on a, on a plane. And that just shows the level of our uh, determination our, our young officers have and that sort of thing. And we'll talk a little bit later about her decision making as far as giving up free leave. <laughs> but, but uh, and I don't remember as a cadet uh, having these opportunities to come to Sycon or Estonia, but I'm very glad that you have them. Uh, I don't even remember getting outside of the gate to Highland Falls, which is a town outside of West Point. But I um, want to thank the leadership of the ACI, the Army Cyber Institute, Chris Hartley and, and Andy Hall for continuing to support the cadets coming here and Paul Tortora's crew, the mids. Uh, it is, of course, a disclaimer uh, is necessary for someone in the uh, Department of Defense, the U.S. I, I'm here in my personal capacity, not speaking for the United States government, the United States Army, West Point, or anything like that. It's, uh, I'm here in my personal capacity. My fellow panelists have done a great job, and uh, I certainly agree with everything Lise and Manon have had to say. Uh, but if we all say the same, or agree on everything, that would be boring. So I'm gonna maybe be a little provocative here. But what I'd like to suggest is maybe an observation that certain states are perfectly happy having cyber attacks attributed to them. Uh, or at least they don't seem to mind having them attributed to him. I just have a couple slides here to help frame the discussion. Uh, you've heard the legal aspects of attribution. As I think about the issue, though, uh, it's occurred to me recently that we may want to look at attribution through a different framework. You hear about all the incidents. Uh, we don't have to get into all of them necessarily, but we certainly can. You, you hear a lot of association with states. You don't hear great uh, worldwide response you hear. Um, some denials, certainly, I agree, but uh, you don't hear it as much, and it's my thought that maybe certain states don't mind uh, being labeled perpetrators in this regard. The current framework is victim-focused. The typical question being, is a victim state willing to publicly attribute the attack to another state? As you've heard, sometimes that, that is a question and also assumes that the, the perpetrator, I think as a, as a town manual said, purportedly responsible state, wants to avoid attribution. And uh, I would like to change that to suggest, I don't think that view is wrong, but I would like to add an inquiry of basically looking at the perpetrator's motivations in addition to the victim uh, and whether or not the victim state is willing or able to attribute. Uh, certainly the examples are, are many, and Lee's went through a lot of those, and we know the states that are generally associated with them, not Pecha, Wanna Cry, DNC, financial uh, institutions, intellectual property theft, even Stuxnet. We're not always talking about quote unquote bad actors that want to avoid attribution. It can be for a variety of reasons that we'll get into both policy and legal uh, in a minute. And this is all open source, of course, none of this is based on any classified knowledge. This is, this is just um, very public uh, reports, as you've heard from Lee's. Now, the most important part is to, what I think, do not assume the perpetrator wants to avoid attribution. Oftentimes, we, we think that's the case. And the questions to ask, which the answers to which may inform this approach, I would offer a few. What explains the lapse in tradecraft? You see sloppiness, you see um, language, time zone indicators of, of certain attacks that are, that are quite clear. Was that intentional? Um, or is it just simply a lapse in tradecraft? I certainly leave that to the technical folks. But uh, it, is, it does occur to me that that's a bit of sloppiness and a surprise. Why are the denials unconvincing and or non-existence? Uh, states do deny, as I've said, but the silence can be deafening sometimes, and it feels like they're okay in some cases with 
being attributed uh, to them. And I say also, what is the most obvious explanation? The Occam's razor of international law, I, I would say applied to international law, the most obvious explanation may be the most likely for who conducted the operation. If you look at Sony Pictures, uh, my 11-year-old daughter could probably figure out if there's a movie about a dictator who might want to uh, respond to that. Uh, notice I did not say my 13-year-old son. I'm not sure he would get it. I think he would. I think he would <laughs> figure it out. But that one is sort of obvious. So then the question becomes, why? Why would anyone tacitly, maybe not overtly, uh, as a state, accept attribution? I offer several possibilities. Again, this is, this is just a way of thinking about it and uh, what I'm considering here. Um, first, that the state is seeking attention, right? We have, we have clearly a, a statecraft argument that certain states want to increase their world standing. We can think of those uh, even with some human rights uh, issues and that they may want to hide that or to embellish their standing in the world by having this capability in the cyber realm. As a great scholar and friend recently reminded me uh, from Dr. Strangelove, I think Peter Sellers said, the whole point of having a doomsday machine is lost if you keep it a secret. And so kind of like celebrities in the US and other places, no press is bad press for some of these countries or states in international law. And they're perfectly fine with having things associated with them or being in the news for something other than failures at, at the political economic level or even just not being at the same level as other states. Classic asymmetric warfare, right? Um, if you can't fight on the same battlefield, maybe go, go asymmetric, go hybrid, go unconventional and have that sort of uh, leverage and that sort of power. And we see that it may be working. The US uh, Department of Defense cyber strategy just this past year came out, names four countries, that we're, we're not surprised, uh, China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia. And so even the naming of them as an adversary and a worthy adversary in the cyber realm raises their stature, certainly in some way. I would also argue that states uh, seek to illustrate their own capabilities while demonstrating a victim state's vulnerabilities. This is kind of a deterrence flipped around, right? If you want to go specific, they will want to show the country that, that they may be attacking or tacitly acknowledging a cyber attack having been attributed to them in a way of saying, don't do this again. Generally showing the power of the world if we want to talk general deterrence, but again, flipping that from the victim's perspective to the attacker's perspective, and in a way of preventing others with messing with them if they don't have power in other areas. It may be as simple as leadership seeking domestic favor to show their own state that uh, they have power and strength, and we could think of some countries that might be interested in that, and just to, as, a, as a way of showing their own population that they are still relevant. Or it may be simply that the costs are just not high enough, at least technically they may be. I, I, I'm not a technical expert in any way, uh, but at least in terms of policy and law, maybe we can suggest that there's not enough punishment to deter them. There's simply the costs are not high enough, so they don't mind having attacks attributed to them. Simply put, certain states benefit from having cyber attacks attributed to them, regardless of where we draw the line. Now, once properly framed, uh, I think we can ask the same question from a legal perspective. If you're the perpetrator, why tacitly accept attribution from a legal perspective? And I have a, just a few thoughts on that. And the first may be that the state does not believe it is committing a wrongful act. Uh, you see, it's, again, relatively underwhelming efforts to hide identity. Uh, even, you could think about states commonly linked to, to Stuxnet, uh, maybe suggest some belief that the state is not committing a wrongful act legally, which leads into other debates for which we don't have time, but its uh, sovereignty uh, comes to mind. 
where the action may be justified if it's, for example, to thwart a nuclear capability. Again, I'm not s suggesting this is all uh, my thoughts. I'm not uh, aware of anything in particular where this is the case, but I just, uh, it makes sense to me. Or the UK view in such areas as we see now uh, about sovereignty being, maybe being a little bit more of a guiding principle than an inviolable rule according, you know, in accordance with the UN Charter. But again, flipping the, the view, and notice we did not say just bad actors are willing to have attacks attributed to them. It could be uh, quote unquote good actors. It's just the idea that they might accept it. It could also be that the state is trying to influence state practice or move the needle on lawfulness. I think this is not likely, but um, we want this as something states think about before acting, right? Certainly as lawyers, we would want that. But I'm not sure they do, as you know, state practice can lead to the development of customary international law, um, and it may be some attempt to nudge that forward as a demonstration of state practice. But uh, I don't know that that one is, is the case. It could be that the state is attempting to exploit a gray, air, or gray zone of international law. You've heard this point before. Again, a type of asymmetric warfare, is it not? where states committed to rule of law are less likely to operate in the gray zone than states that do not share rule of law commitment, as these uh, mentioned, I think, uh, very nicely. States seek to exploit international law rules that are poorly delineated. Attribution may be the same. Uh, opening a possibility, what does direction mean? What is control? What are instructions? Um, as Lee's laid out the law. And the uh, le legal ambiguity hobbles a response, as many great scholars have written. But uh, make it no mistake, when a, an attack is minimally destructive but maxim, maximally uh, disruptive, it still can be below the threshold of wrongfulness legally, and that can get into the, the gray zone piece. Of course, it could be anything else. We don't know. We maybe think about some of those uh, possibilities uh, during Q&A or after. And uh, I would just offer, we never know what a state's intentions are, obviously. Um, but knowing or thinking about things, at least differently, can help us close legal gaps. So there is a legal connection here. Every situation's different. Here come my caveats. Every situation's different. Um, I realize that, we'll never know what the true intentions of a state are. And my way is just another consideration in a difficult area. And uh, with those caveats said, I, I am more than willing to be pinned down and recorded as saying, certain states may be happy in certain situations to have certain <laughs> things attributed to them. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, and I'm sure Metallica would endorse your, your swimming upstream, your, your running against the current. Uh, yeah, this flies kind of in the face of the whole title of the conference, right? Silent battle, and here comes Rob saying, well, maybe not so silent. Uh, you know, some of what you describe, Rob, reminded me of, uh, of Herb Lin's work on loud cyber operations. I think from the technical community and from the policy community, some of what you've explored has been has been addressed, but not in the way you did particularly. Can you distinguish some of his work? I think some in the room may be familiar with his work on loud cyber operations. Is there a distinction or a difference between what you're describing and what, and, and Herb's work uh, there? Uh, so stew on that. You've got the shortest time to work with. I know, <laughs> okay. I know that. Uh, so Lee's now to you on the question that I, I posed to you. Uh, these private efforts, so mandiant, crowd strike, friend or foe to the really nuanced or, or subtle approaches that states are taking to political attribution? It's probably both. Um, there are some aspects of uh, non-state actor attribution that I'm sure frustrate uh, states. I mean, states may feel compelled to respond when a non-state actor in a private firm has attributed uh, malicious cyber activity to a state. 
um, so there may be a reputational concerns. So states may feel that they're being outperformed by a private company and not like that uh, horribly. But on the other hand, and there are studies on this as well, I mean, private sector attribution can be very helpful for states and help them bypass the classification uh, dilemma. Uh, they don't necessarily need to uh, come out with as much uh, previously classified information as they perhaps otherwise would. Um, and uh, some companies surely have access to some type of information that the state itself does not have. Um, FireEye has got sensors all over the world, whereas states uh, typically tend to have their sensors rather in their own territory than all over the world. Uh, so from a policy perspective, and I'm sure policy experts uh, are much more qualified to opine on this, uh, I think there are pros and cons, but as a matter of law, I don't think that private sector attribution frustrates the law at all. I mean, international law has dealt with uh, non-public uh, private uh, sources of evidences um, since the very beginning. I mean, international courts, they accept uh, witness testimonies, they accept um, uh, expert, uh, expert uh, testimonies, so I don't think that's a problem per se for international law, at least. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Manon, you, so your question was uh, the interaction between the highly coordinated and delicate feeling, very diplomatic feeling process you described at the EU, uh, and then some emerging proposals uh, in some sense to outsource uh, attribution, to make it a private effort, even adjudicative, adjudicative functions, feasible uh, to have state buy-in to these processes? Uh, and second, if yes, with what conditions or what provisos? I would also like to pick up on Lisa's answer, and I think we'll roll into only one question, I would say. Please uh, do, The second yeah. one doesn't count. Um, <laughs> so, um, I indeed, I think it's, it's, it's very useful, and I think the private sector has a lot of information that can be used for attribution, in particular, for instance, when it comes to, uh, to imposing sanctions, as that uh, must be based at open source information, and indeed, you can you know, divert from the classification pro uh, uh, problem, etc. cetera. Um, you also see the cooperation between states and private sectors when it comes to sharing of information. I mean, there's a lot of private uh, public co uh, cooperation when it comes to certs, but also, for instance, Europol, so law enforcement. Uh, so you see this, this, um, uh, this very successful cooperation taking place where it becomes problematic when uh, private companies uh, want to take over the responsibility of states when it comes to international law or when it comes to international relations. Um, and in that sense, initiatives of um, either uh, uh, private companies uh, proposing that we should uh, uh, negotiate a, a treaty as states. Are you or, thinking of, of cyber Geneva Convention? I, I mean, yes, indeed. Um, uh, or a, a state, a private company saying that they will uh, establish an attribution council that will then give us everything we need to impose consequences that have a significant or could have significant effect on international relations and even on, on, on peace uh, um, and stability. I think that's something that is not not desirable states pertain a special responsibility when it comes to this and it should uh, remain like this although the e i mean the eu does recognize the responsibility of all actors uh, including the private sector and that could be indeed when it comes to sharing information which touches upon uh, attribution but also when it comes to uh, developing secure products and services uh, so other stakeholders have other responsibilities uh, these are ours so to say so um, that. Therefore, that answers the first question and leaves the second to, uh, to the crowd. So. Uh, fair enough. So crowdsourcing the second question here then. Uh, Rob, uh, are you and Herb Lynn uh, seeing eye to eye on this, <laughs> or are you talking about different things? Uh, I'm familiar with Dr. Lynn's uh, work, and um, I think it's, it is a little different. I distinguish um, his is a little louder than what I'm saying. Like I Metallica loud? Pretty or? loud. Pretty loud. <laughs> I mean, okay. Silent battle, uh -huh. you're gonna have some folks writing on loud cyber, but, uh, or we can also see what uh, Dr. Lin says after this. I think he, he snuck in and out, but he's he on did. the next we panel. Yeah, we had him, we had him. 
Uh, but I think if I know Dr. Lin's work, it's more about self-attribution from the beginning. Uh, a state actor could, could say right away, this is our uh, attack mechanism and uh, self-attribute in that way. Mine's a little less, his is a volume of 10 out of 10, mine would be like a seven or eight, mm -hmm. uh, all between, f between there and, and the silent battle. Uh, my analogy is, you know, if you get to the individual person level, if someone were to be accused of doing something wrong, uh, the, the loud would be someone saying, yes, I did it and I'll do it again. And mine would be more like, maybe I did it, maybe I didn't. What are you going to do about it? Hmm. Um, but again, I, uh, those are just some, some things. Uh, I like to think about a lot of great scholarship in this area. Even in our conference book, uh, noticed just yesterday, there's, there's a really neat article on, on loud cyber. So again, it's, um, a lot of folks are thinking about this. And I would just put mine a notch below that on the volume. Fair enough. OK, well, we have time remaining uh, for questions from the room. The protocol I'd like to use is uh, to have the microphones uh, used. I'll just call on folks. And the first hand I see is Kubo. Uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Uh, it's Kubo Machak, University of Exeter. I have a question for Lise and for Rob, if I may. So uh, Lise, if I understood you correctly, when you talked about unilateral self-help, you suggested that the standard of proof to use is the standard of reasonableness. Did I get that right? Correct. OK, so I would just put it to you that this is maybe the wrong lens through which to look at this. And I wonder what you think about this. To my mind, standard of proof is very directly linked to burden of proof. And so these are concepts that we use in adjudicatory settings, but not in the situations of unilateral self-help. There, the correct lens, to my mind, is simply the allocation of risk. So if you are acting, you're, act you're placing the risk upon yourself that you might be acting unlawfully. And so whereas if you look at it from the reasonableness perspective, then basically what you're saying, if the state makes a mistake, but it's a mistake that a reasonable state would make in those situations, it would still be acting lawfully. And so I would put it to you that this poses a risk of escalation, especially as countermeasures are concerned, and it goes against the orthodox understanding of the law of countermeasures. So that's, uh, that's uh, my question about reasonableness. And Rob, I think the elephant in the room here is the geopolitical considerations. So if we talk about attribution, you know, there are basically three categories of countries. Those that are outside of the attribution game, then those who attribute, and those who are attributed to. And it's something that you didn't mention. So I just wonder to what extent these geopolitical considerations play into your analysis. Could those be some additional you know, reasons why some states are happy to be attributed? Or not? Thanks. Thanks, Kuba. Liz, you want to start? Sure. So I think we're actually uh, in, in agreement, and I would interpret the law the same way. It's true that in the context of unilateral self-help, the term standard of proof isn't normally used. But I think it's helpful just to think through the issue. So for the right of self-defense, the first question would be, does the state need to have absolute certainty as to attribution of the armed attack to a state or a non-state actor if the state buys, in, uh, uh, buys into the argument that self-defense can be exercised against non-state actors. So does the state need to have 100% proof before it can resort to self-defense? And here my answer would be no, and I, su I suppose you would uh, answer the, the question in the negative as well. And then the secondary question arises, what if the state makes a mistake? And and uh, I would say that if the state makes the mistake, then yes, the state has acted on its own risk. So if it uses force against an innocent state, it is not excused in international law. So it may be obliged to uh, provide reparation, for example. But the first question is really important. Do you need 100% proof to be able to resort to force in the first place? Because if that was the case in, uh, in almost every circumstance, whether it's a cyber armed attack or it's mining a vessel or the launch of a missile, I mean, in many cases, states won't have 100% proof. So they would have their hands tied in the vast majority of cases. Well, if I may, just a brief follow up. So like, the, the, the point is that before you get to a judicial organ, the, the use of the term standard of proof doesn't help. It's neither here nor there. You need to be before a court, and only then there is a certain standard of proof that's required. Of course, you don't need to have 100% certainty. But to say that 
the standard of proof is reasonableness doesn't say anything because by that you're just saying it's case by case and then we will see how things go while still risking that a state might say, well, we were acting under the standard of reasonableness because everybody would have thought the same thing and thus we didn't act unlawfully. But what I hear you saying is that we're on the same page that a state that makes a mistake takes the risk of acting unlawfully and it would be acting unlawfully. So I would just put it to you that we should probably leave you know, the terminology of standard of proof and burden of proof for judicial determinations, and it's not appropriate because we don't have an international law of evidence to use it in these bilateral re relationships. I mean, I'm perfectly fine to refrain from using the term standard of proof, although the subject matter is still the same. How much evidence, how well does the state need, how well do the facts need to be established for the state to respond unilaterally? <laughs> Rob. Yes, Sean. Kubo had a question for you. Yes, Kubo. I think <laughs> the first thing I would do with any question is absolutely, without doubt, consult the cyber law toolkit. <laughs> <laughs> but assuming that it's not in there, because I admit this is not the tightest <laughs> legal argument I've, I've ever had, more of a policy, uh, I think the categories you lay out are exactly right. I think they reinforce in a way, what I'm saying, states enjoy being in a particular category, regardless of what it is. And I'm just suggesting they might double down on that behavior, enjoy the cachet that that represents, whether they're always attributed to or part of groups that are always uh, attributing or maybe unwilling to, and that they, I'm suggesting that they may enjoy that category. Um, I do think some have written about, you know, a centralized attribution body, which removes the politics, uh, perhaps, um, whether it's private or public actors as part of that, mostly private, I think, uh, we, we might have. And that would remove a little bit of politics, a willingness to, to attribute, as has been suggested, or the um, uh, ramifications of attributing to anyone or having something attributed to you. So I, I certainly agree with you, but I think um, there's a lot of possibilities here for, for scholarship, for research, writing, and for uh, moving ahead in the future. There, were, in the future. there were two questions then on this side of the room. Uh, my name is Lisa Post and I'm with the McCain Institute for International Leadership. I'm not a lawyer, so I feel the rather flawed and faulty after the formidable Dr. Machak here. But my question is really why would you, in terms of what attribution gives to us in the policy and diplomacy world. So why would you even attribute unless it gives you a political advantage, in particular in terms of deterrence, which makes, for me as a practitioner, the finer points almost irrelevant. And given that the economic and diplomatic measures that we've gotten access to as currently responses under international law, don't really work anymore. Naming and shaming, as Robert pointed out, doesn't work if you get bragging rights out of it. <laughs> so what attributions got getting us in this current world where our responses are so limited, unless the activity is above the threshold of an armed attack, okay. are limiting? to a point where everyone else is learning from the Russian playbook. Yeah, so, so what would you wish international law gave you access to, or gave nations access to, in terms of responses, still in peacetime, so that attribution would be meaningful again? OK, so for the panel, you know, Lisa's comments seem most directly addressed at the fit between maybe changing state behavior in attribution, more public statements, although equivocal, as you pointed out. Uh, is that change in state behavior somehow a comment on the state of international law? Are they subtly signaling to us that it is inadequate in some sense? Are these the beginning stages of, of movements in international law on attribution? 
Well, to answer Lisa, your question directly, I mean, uh, you often need to attribute in law in order to protect your legal rights. You don't only need to attribute to engage in self-defense pursuant to Article 51 of the UN Charter. You also need to attribute to engage in, for example, countermeasures. So you can only engage in countermeasures against the state if there is a state behind a cyber operation. So there are reasons for which attribution is required also in law. But as to the public statements and whether they, um, uh, whether they reflect a dissatisfaction with international law, n not necessarily, I would say. I just think that states are um, um, unwilling to draw those, uh, draw those lines in the sand, to be, uh, to be quite honest. And, um, and there is a lot of talk about cyber stability, maintaining cyber stability. Well, maybe it is in the more powerful state's interest to uh, maintain this type of stability that we have right now, rather than to have restrictive rules that not only take options off the table for other countries, but also options off the table for themselves. Other panel members on the question? I, know. I mean, the, obviously I said there are reasons uh, that attribution could benefit. Um, I mean, the reasons are showing publicly that there are rules, that these rules, uh, when you violate them, that there could be consequences. Um, it could be um, pointing out certain threats. Uh, it could be um, uh, making sure that uh, you engage directly with the perpetrator to to have an understanding uh, what's right and what's wrong. However, attribution is never something in itself. It's not something that you do and that's the end of the case. Um, and just pointing out because you can uh, is also not leading to anything. So I think when you look at attribution and why are you doing it, it's because it fits into your wider approach. So you have a certain perpetrator, you see threats, maybe incidents coming, and then you're thinking, okay, what is my strategy? What kind of measures do I have in my toolbox? What do, kind of relations do I have with third countries or with uh, international organizations and how can we leverage everything we have to influence the behavior of this particular state um, into the direction of responsible behavior and attribution could be one element of, of this um, but it's certainly not the only element because in the end if you if you name and shame some states are not even receptive to that um, and I, I like the thinking uh, indeed of some states might even like it uh, because it gives them the posture they need uh, uh, on the international stage. So um, uh, my plea is to really think about, okay, what can attribu attribution do in our wider approach to make sure that we influence behavior in the end game of cyber stability? So. Rob? Great points. I, I totally agree. Um, you can't, some of, many have said this before me, but it's hard to shame the shameless, right? So. We escalate maybe sanctions, maybe offensive cyber operations, and I, I love the question. It's a great question. It just reminds me of sort of a, a military thing that we think about, is, especially as legal advisors. Can you do something, and should you? Right. So again, this is not directly responsive, but there's many things. We don't want to reveal sources and that sort of thing. We don't want to escalate, uh, not necessarily any one particular state, but a lot of states are thinking of that. So even if you could as a matter of law or you're, you're willing to uh, as a state, should you? So that's just something that uh, I think it, it reinforces your point, Lisa, and it's, it's um, a great one, but it does fit in nicely, and I, I, I defer to uh, these and Manon on their points. Okay. There was one more question, I believe, in the middle. Gentleman in the blue jacket. Yes, you, sir. Can we? Do you have a microphone? I think we're being recorded. So. Here we go. It's it's coming your way. Thanks for that. Hi. Okay. Um, Specifically, I, I was going to ask about the attribution and more uh, in depth about what plans do you have for, but you were talking about doing a, a body that, that could sort of centralize this process. The reason why I want to ask this is because actually I'm, I'm from FireEye right now. You, you mentioned Mandiant earlier. Uh, for example, our organization does a lot of this attribution process. And what I can see as, as an Intel analyst is basically different organizations come up 
uh, let's say we come up with different uh, results on what the clusters of activity look like. Because oftentimes, sometimes we can find very clear stuff, sometimes it's very easy to know who it was, but sometimes it's a bit more complicated and you can find different clusters of activity that do not match for one or another reason. So if we were to have a, a body in the middle trying to make that decision, I just wanted to ask about your thoughts of how would it look like? Like, would it go to a private sector and see, I don't know, like the results from many different companies and trying to moderate? Would it be that we have a new organism that does attribution and that's the attribution that counts? Uh, I don't know, like how would you solve this uncertainty over the attribution? I know, it sounds like that second question is coming around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, not because we have a body and that's a state. And the state can, you know, the state attributes, it's their sovereign decision. So if you have data, put it out there, great. Open source intelligence, open source information can be gathered by states and states can take that decision on their own. So there's no need to have a private entity attributing for a state. A state has this has its own capability to do so, and if they want this, they can do this at an EU level, coordinated or with other partners. So I understand there's a, a need to um, well present uh, uh, the data that you have, but great, put it online. We'll this use it. This is sort of a, a well-worn approach to international law, right? We could just fix it if we took it out of the hands of states. Uh, any, are we all sovereigntists here on the panel? Any warming to the proposal that, that maybe this would all just be better off if some, some neutral, independent, detached body were making these states rather than, or, or making these decisions rather than states, please? To be honest, I haven't given a lot of thought to this. I think uh, those proposals are born out of frustration with the status quo. So there's this feeling that we need to take uh, the situation further somehow. And if states are not attributing, if states are not taking action, if states are not drawing lines in the sand, well, maybe somebody else should. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm somewhere in between. I too am somewhat frustrated with states, to be honest with you, especially the more capable states who are in a position to, uh, to advance uh, normative order in cyberspace. Uh, I think most countries actually in the world today are, are not involved in this debate at a very high level. They are only catching up. But, uh, but the states that could advance rule of law online, uh, norms of responsible state behavior online, they are reluctant to do so for various reasons. And, and often I do think they should. Rob? I think um, we have seen some private companies attribute, right? Um, private yep. industry uh, folks, and again, not going into a ton of examples. But not in a definitive or a binding right. way, right? Right. Yeah. Um, some have argued they're faster, they're more detailed, uh, they're broader, different motivations, different implications of private sector attributing over public, obviously. And, but one thing I found compelling for that argument and the, sort of the reason I mentioned is you can persuade different audiences who may be skeptical of states' motivations as a combination of law, policy, and that sort of thing. Um, you, you certainly could reach a different audience if you had a central attribution body. Um, or just private sector attributions. And uh, I think that's important uh, too. Of course, the analogy, you could have a bounty hunter be very quick about uh, something that a law enforcement might not be able to. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have law enforcement do the job. It just um, is sort of a, something I think of. Um, there are considerations on all sides. Sounds like a great uh, job security for law professors, right? I like it. Yeah. yeah. John, can I maybe p pick up on what um, what has been said? Because of course, Mano. I I recognize the the, um, the audience part and the credibility part, but um, if something happens, it's not that um, private entities are not engaged in this and not putting it out there. So they are. The question is, should they bundle their sources and should they come together in a council and then provide one? advice to states and now, you know, please act on it. Right. So, of course, when, I, I'm, I'm assured that when a state will respond and, I mean, will, when they will do it with measures that go beyond uh, just declaratory, there will be definitely uh, private sector um, right. uh, engagement and private sector conclusions that support uh, this action. Right. So I don't see one or the other as, uh, it, it's not a contradictory, so to right. say not wanting that's a partnership. 
So our time is winding down a bit, but I think we have several questions. Why don't we take them sort of in serial order? I, I see a question here, uh, the gentleman in the beige jacket as well, and one in the back. Could we take all three questions uh, back to back, and then I'll let the panelists uh, take those up as they, as they choose, please. Professor Barnsby, with your proposed you. framework, do you think a standardized punishment procedure would affect a state's willingness to accept attribution? Okay, we'll, we'll hold okay. that one. That one's directed at Professor Barnsby. Uh, the gentleman in the front here. Um, hello, Przemysław Rogowski, Jagiellonian University of Krakow. So uh, my question also goes to Professor Barnsby. And um, so you spoke about um, one of the motivations for the states of not caring about attributions is the exploitation of gray zones of international law. But my question would be, are we not in, in a certain way contributing to this gray zone by, for instance, certain states uh, uh, denying the, the existence of certain rules, such as a rule of sovereignty in a cyberspace? And therefore, you know, why should a, a, a state care about being attributed with a conduct that is not really uh, a violation of any particular rule of international law. Thank you. Thank you. And in the back. Oh, this is Barry. Yeah, right, right there. On the side here. Yeah. Barry, the final question is yours. OK, thank you. Um, Barry Sander, FGV Brazil. Um, I just want to return to the earlier question, because I thought it was a really interesting question about the value added of international law, the value added of attribution. Um, because if you ask an international lawyer, what's the value added of attribution of below the threshold uh, operations? The immediate answer is, well, you get access to countermeasures. But I think that's the elephant in the room, is that states haven't really come up with effective countermeasures which motivate them to actually attribute legally. And I think we maybe could benefit, and I guess this is the question, would you agree we could maybe benefit from a wider discussion of what effective countermeasures would be against peacetime cyber operations? Thanks, Barry. So, Rob, let's start with you, and then we'll work sure. our way down the, the, the panel. Um, for Kevin, I, our cadet, um, I feel like you could have asked that question three weeks ago, about 5,000 miles west of here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 great job, great job stepping up asking questions. I love it. So standard punishment structure. Um, I just feel like it's a great idea. I feel like every, every situation is different, so it would be hard to standardize, right? Classic answer. We, we, there are the motivations we've t all talked about, and so you, you probably would not see that. It feeds into the second question, right, a little bit, which is uh, are we helping things by by taking what could be a very clear standard, instructions, direction, control, and saying, well, this is, this is very hard to figure out what instructions are and that sort of thing. Um, perhaps they're, you know, again, or, or, or a lawyer talking, making policy arguments, uh, like me, not helping out very much. And I think it's a great point. I, I don't quite disagree with that uh, question either. So um, classic uh, response. But um, that, those are my initial thoughts. I know your thoughts. Well, I think I just would like to respond to, to the last question, because although we need to discuss these issues indeed, um, the question is if they would al always need to be put, put to the forefront. Um, uh, there's work ahead. Um, this work should be done in the UNGGE. Uh, we should discuss how international law applies and we should further work on the norms of responsible state behavior, in particular when it comes to implementation. But we should also bear in mind that we do not want escalation in cyberspace. We do not want um, cyberspace to be used for all kinds of strategic objectives by states because in the end, who will suffer from it? All of us. So yes, there is a discussion about uh, how countermeasures uh, work and all the conditions, etc. But we should also bear in mind that in principle, we're working here on stability. Uh, so if attribution could contribute to that, um, yes, we should do it. And there are several ways uh, in which we could apply it, uh, even non-public ways. It should not always be uh, out in the open, naming and shaming and pointing fingers, sometimes not even effective. Um, uh, but we should keep our eyes on, on, on the ball. Um, and, uh, and, and not try to, uh, to escalate unnecessarily because it's fashion. Please, the first and the final word goes to you. 
first and foremost. So I'll pick the question about uh, what is the value of naming and shaming if you're not naming and shaming for violations of the law? I, mean, I agree with you that cherry picking, irrespective of which country, which side is cherry picking, is problematic. And it, uh, it takes away a bit, uh, the moral ground of a state to say that cyberspace is governed by international law if the state at the same time is cherry picking which rules of international law apply and do not apply. So I agree that this is a problem. Do, do accusations of states having violated international law carry more weight than accusations of states having uh, breached norms of responsible state behavior? Well, I think to an extent they do. Yes, sometimes states may not mind them, but I, probably there is only one country in the world that doesn't care at all when it's labeled a lawbreaker, that's North Korea. But even countries like uh, Russia and China, uh, they do care when they're labeled lawbreakers. Russia worked quite hard in the Security Council to justify its invasion of Ukraine as an exercise of self-defense. China, outside the cyber context, uh, works very hard to justify its uh, naval maneuvers in the law of the sea. So no country, maybe except for North Korea, wants to be labeled a lawbreaker in international relations. And even if this, uh, the naming and shaming for having violated international law doesn't change their behavior, it nevertheless imposes cost. Even if it is minimal cost, it imposes reputational cost on them. Well, we are precisely on time. Please join me in thanking the panelists for their thoughts.